Few people get as close to Africa's animals as wildlife vets. If they're tending to dogs, it's probably a wild dog. If they're called out to look after an injured cat, chances are it could be a lion. Joining me today to discuss his life as a wildlife vet is Joel Elvish. Joel, welcome to Tales That's Told. Thank you very much for having me, Richard. It's Appreciate pleasure, it. Pleasure to have you here. So, Joel, what kind of person becomes a wildlife vet? So, I'd say, you know, first thing is obviously passion for wildlife mm. and the bush, you know, but that's, you know, selling it very short. And I think sort of any type of person can become a wildlife vet. Because if I thought of how I ended up here, I'm not really entirely sure how I did sometimes. Uh, well, tell us how you did then. Yeah, so I'd say, I mean, starting off as a kid, uh, instead of Disney movies, I always ended up watching a lot of the, the first wildlife documentaries. Mm -hmm. That sort of Eternal Enemies and Londolozi. They were done by the Joubert's and a guy by the name of John Varty. Mm -hmm. And sort of in those, you know, John Varty was very immersive in his documentaries. He's always crawling into, you know, aardvark holes looking for snakes. And he was in the water trying to film hippos up close and personal. And I thought that was the absolute best lifestyle, you know. He was the Bear grills of wildlife. You could it? say that. Okay. Um, so, you know, growing up like that, I was convinced I'd be a game ranger. I read a couple books, you know, and sort of immersed myself in the bush and everything that was it. And, you know, I got to high school, I ended up going a bit sports mad for lack of a better explanation. I played every sport I possibly could. And following on from that, I decided to take a gap year once I matriculated and I wanted to travel a little bit. And my parents said, that's absolutely okay, but before you end up going and traveling the world, you're going to have to apply for university so that we know you're coming back. Mm. So I thought, you know, being a typical guy, I went onto the university website and one of the things that popped up was sports science. And I thought, well, perfect. You know, I didn't really look at what else you could study. So I applied for sports science and I got in and I went on my gap year. I traveled a little bit, coached a bit of sport at a, at a high school. And when I started university, I mean, I, I enjoyed sports science, but it, it really just didn't ignite anything in me for lack of a better description. And I had a couple of friends of mine that were studying things like zoology or a bachelor of sciences, and we'd always study together. And we'd sit there and I'd open up my books and I'd find myself sort of, you know, looking over at this zoology textbook and thinking like, you know, what the heck am I doing? Like, mm. Check out what these guys are studying, you know, this is so much more interesting. I absolutely get completely distracted and instead of studying my stuff, I'd end up, you know, reading through zoology textbooks as, as they went through them. So pretty much, I mean, it was probably three, four months into my, my sports science year, I knew for a fact I had to change. Um, and I ended up changing to a, a BSc in zoology. And, you know, through a whole lot of sort of life experiences and, and people pushing me, they said, you know, well, why don't you apply for VET? And I thought, what? You reckon? I apply for VET? You know, can you do that? Mm -hmm. So they said, yeah, well, you're doing a Bachelor of Sciences. You know, you seem to have an interest in the bush and wildlife and animals and all that. You know, why don't you apply for a VET position, you know? So I thought, OK, you know, I'll give it a crack. And lo and behold, I got in. I still have no idea. And, you know, it's sort of... All of that led to where I am now, you know, and it was just a sort of passion that grew as, as my studies started, S sort of with zoology first. I mean, I always said if, if I hadn't got into vet, I would have, uh, I think I would have thoroughly enjoyed zoology. Absolutely. I find it um, completely interesting. And so I got into vet, uh, you know, went through my, my five, six, seven years of studying and, and slowly but surely that passion just grew and I realized, you know, there's this way of, you know, the absolute ep epitome of working with wildlife would be a wildlife vet. You know, you absolutely cannot get closer. The, you know, you, you're mobilizing these animals, you're right there with them. There's no way that you can get closer to wildlife than, than working as a wildlife vet. And that passion just grew throughout my, my university career. And thereafter, you know, I, I got to this point where I am now and I thought, how could I have done anything else? Mm. You know, I certainly couldn't have done anything else. This is exactly where I want to be and it's it's quite funny how it all sort of ended up here because I was never one of those you know you talk to a lot of vets and they from you know a very young age knew they wanted to do nothing else but but be a veterinarian and somehow I still don't know how I ended up here but it's you know one thing led to another and here I am today and now that I'm here I just absolutely can't think of doing or being anything else but a wildlife vet. Mm. Is the critical difference between you and other um guess colleagues who you went through veterinary school with who didn't go down the wildlife route is, is the critical difference the, the love of wildlife I wouldn't say so you know there was uh, there's a lot of people that were interested in wildlife mm. I mean the, I remember it was probably my second or third year one of the lecturers came in and he said you know 
who wants to be, we had to, we had to decide on sort of the electives we were going to take. And he, you know, he asked us to hold up your hands for small animals, for equines, you know, so horses, um, large stock, like your, your cattle, sheep and goats. And there was a whole lot of options. And then, you know, for wildlife. And obviously, you know, there was a lot of people that held up their hands for wildlife. And I'd say, you know, everyone had the love for wildlife and a passion for it. But it's, it's, it's quite a difficult industry to break into. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, South African wildlife went through a sort of phase where now the the wildlife vet industry was quite saturated and so to break into it was very difficult so i got very very lucky to to end up where i was as a matter of timing pretty much um so i'd say a lot of guys would have absolutely loved to become wildlife vets but just sort of maybe the 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 passion wasn't there completely to follow through and and hope for the best and and see themselves ending up there mm. um, and it was just sort of an an idea that they had, you know, and, and thought I'd, I'd love to be a wildlife vet, but not entirely sure that it's going to happen just because of how difficult it is to get there. Um, and even myself, you know, I thought that I didn't realize or, or think it would happen so quickly. I mean, I had plans of, of specializing and, and doing a whole lot of other things to get myself to this point, you know, and, and just like I said, a matter of timing worked, worked out really well. And I ended up with this position and, and it's, I mean, I lucked out like I can't even explain. Okay, tell us if there's such a thing, what, mm. the, what the typical day of a wildlife vet looks like. So I'd say that there definitely isn't a, a typical day and no two days are the same, but I guess it's, <laughs> it's the same as, you know, they say if you, if you drive into the Kruger National Park and you go game viewing, no two days are ever going to be the same. So if you're working with wildlife, it's, it's essentially going to be like that as well. So it is so up and down. I mean, you can go from, from one day to being absolutely crazy, flat out busy from four o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. And then the next day you can go and hit a few golf balls um, and just wait to be called, you know, because there's, there's so much that, that runs the days, you know, that is out of, out of your control, essentially. So if, if I'd say the major difference between being a wildlife vet and being sort of any sort of other vet is just a, a measure of control. Um, you know, you're relying on, on things such as permits. Um, you know, wildlife is not essentially owned by someone and they can be like, okay, it's sick, I'm gonna take it into the clinic or, you know, call the vet out because they're in camps and that. And that, to a point, there's a, there's a semblance of control in the commercial side of things. Where there's camps and, and, you know, you're going there, you're most likely gonna be able to dart that animal. But if you're working with the conservation side of things and you're looking at animals that are running on extensive environments, then there's a whole lot of factors that can, you know, run your day. So, you know, you're looking at, there's a lot of permits that you require for certain captures. Sometimes you need a helicopter. You need the weather to be playing games then. You know, it's got to play ball. You can't catch in the heat of the day. You can't catch when it's raining. Is the helicopter able to fly? The amount of times there's an issue with a helicopter suddenly or something like that. And there's a whole lot of role players and moving parts. And I'd, I'd say that's what typically makes no two days the same is those sort of variables that you cannot control there's mm. there's just multiple multiple variables that make no two days the same and especially like when it comes to darting an, an animal for example we always say you know you can control and plan as much as possible but for the moment that dart goes in and then that time period that runs till the animal goes down that there is like there's just nothing you can do pretty much you know, that's when you sit and you watch. And for the most part, you can try and use the helicopter to control where the animal's running or whatnot. But once that dart is in until the animal goes down, is that part where you just don't have any control at all. Okay. And so I'd, I'd say things like that are what, what typically makes the no two days the same. Mm. I mean, it's, it just, it, it always varies. And, you know, the species you're working with are so varied. And that's what, that, what, that's what makes it very interesting as well. And then even if you're working with a species you've worked with multiple times, I mean, every capture will, will be something different. And it'll throw up something interesting and, and oftentimes a little scary or hairy or, or it'll go according to plan, you know. Go according to plan the one day and then the next day it'll just all fall apart. So I'd say, yeah, definitely no two days the same by a long shot. Certainly when I think about the messages that we exchanged trying to jack up this, this meeting that we're having now, that you know some things threw up and you said sorry can't do it I'm off to one was to do something with some Cape Buffalo and then yeah. most recently there's a lioness on the loose no exactly so and, I mean that's exactly it mm. uh, you know you can we call it you know the quiet season because essentially capture season in the wildlife industry runs from the beginning of March to the end of October because that's sort of our cool period and 
you know, that's, there's a semblance of control there with um, mass capture and things like that. And once the capture season close, which is, closes, which it did now on the 31st of October, it's essentially meant to be our quiet period. But then we get into what we like to call silly season. And it's just when you, you're running around and your phone keeps ringing and you sit there and you're busy with another case of a lion's escaped and then someone else phones you and they've got an elephant with a snare and, you know, someone's phoned my colleague and he's got a chimp. That's, you know, that's like been the couple, the last couple of days. That's like what we've dealt with, you know, and then we just call it silly season because you just sit there and you're like, what is happening? You know, this is meant to be the quiet times. Like, why is it so chaotic? So then when you try and make plans like we tried, I always think like this is the perfect period. I mean, this is quiet, you know, we're going to have a whole lot of extra time. Mm. Um, and I mean, so far it hasn't completely worked out that way. I mean, as we sit now, you know, we're on standby for a couple captures already, you know, as we're sitting here. Yeah. Does the prior, excuse me, does the prioritization become a, a key factor in certainly. a bunch of different things. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, if you've got something that's that's injured or, or snared or there's, you know, there's a risk to its life or a risk to, to people's lives or anything like that, then obviously you'll prioritize that over a, a capture that's to, let's say, put a collar on. Yep. You know, if it's just to, to capture something and you're going to put a collar on or, it's, or you're moving it between camps for a commercial system, um, you know, obviously you'll prioritize immediately the, the emergencies. And we've done that a couple of times. I mean, we've often... We've been called out in the midst of sort of management work mm. and you know luckily we've got quite a few clients who are very understanding in that sense i mean they could they could also say no you know there's not a chance sorry because at the end of the day it's it's also business you know mm. and um but most of the time like you know we can tell them like look we've got an emergency i've had it i had it i think about two weeks ago we were catching some nyala on a on a property but it was simply for management purposes and i got a call about a leopard that was stuck in a snare and you know I, told them I said look you know I really I have to rush off now um, I, I really apologize I'll be back as soon as I can to to finish up here but um, I'm gonna have to prioritize this because mm. this is an animal that's stuck in the snare you know there's there's animal welfare issues and ethics and that there we can't say okay well you know let's finish up with the Nyala now and then we'll go off and, and get that leopard when we're done here you know you want to respond to that as soon as possible so Definitely. I mean, uh, you know, as they call it in, in human medicine, sort of triage, mm. you know, if they arrive at an accident scene and you triage the patients, it would be the same for us as well. You know, um, you triage your cases. Yeah. So I got from that, it sounds like th there are two parts to, to, being, uh, to having a life as a vet. There's the emergency side and then there's the management side. Yeah. Now, probably the emergency side is kind of self-explanatory. Can you define exactly what management is though? Yeah, so I mean, I'd, I'd say so management more pertains to the commercial side of things. Okay, there to, to the point, okay, I'll, I'll sort of explain it. In, in fact, the two ways that it's generally split, split is, is commercial, or the way I like to look at it is commercial and conservation. So conservation being your extensive parks that are probably focusing on either photographic tourism or, or you know, sort of ecotourism in general, let's put it that way. And then you've got your commercial side, which is focusing on breeding for essentially either the end market is hunting or, or selling the animals as breeding stock so stud breeding facilities or, or camps and things like that and their focus is business um, so when we say management on the commercial side of things it's, it's generally you know rotating animals um, through camp systems for breeding purposes so often let's say you've got a, a nyala camp and you've got a, a big breeding bull in there and he's with the ewes you will pull all the young bulls out of that camp and wean them and then move them to another camp you'll also do things like horn measurements you know you'll knock animals down to to measure their horns so that they can be marketed off you'll you'll it'll could be for vaccination purposes for treatment purposes uh, for putting in tags um, and most of the time it's it's for management purposes it's generally either to move between camps and, you know, put a bull with uh, a group of ewes or take a group of ewes to a bull so that they can breed in that camp or that your, your camp capacity is now sort of reaching its limit. So you want to pull animals out of there and put them into another camp just to rotate the grazing and rotate the camps. Mm. Um, and then also, like I said, for tags for identification purposes, you know, or if, if animals need to be vaccinated and, and things like that. And then sort of the management side towards the conservation side of things would be things like dehorning. Okay, so dehorning rhino, um, ear notching, collarings for, you know, to a point of sort of management sometimes depending on the reserves or if, or if you're involved with, you know, people that are doing research and, and monitoring and, and so forth on collarings. So the, the big differences are probably the commercial side and the, and the conservation side per se, although oftentimes one contributes to the other.
Yeah. Okay. Let's get into some of the nitty gritty. Yeah. You're f- called out and you've, you're facing um, an injured animal, which happens to be large. It might have horns or tusks or claws or something or other. What goes through your head about what could go wrong? It's quite funny. I mean, most of the time we only it, we laugh about it afterwards when something does go wrong. You don't really think about it too much before and because there's a lot that can go wrong. And that's the variables that I spoke about, you know. So most of the times what we what we try and do when we're approaching any sort of case is if we're dealing with other people and other people are around, we'll sort of do a debriefing of what the plan is during the capture because it's very important for the people that are around because there often is you know when you when you're dealing with wildlife there's obviously a lot of people that are interested in it and especially if you're knocking down something like an elephant or a lion there's obviously people that are around would like to see it mm. um, so it's very important in that sense to just so the people know exactly what's going to happen and what can go wrong but I mean you could spend hours talking to them and explain to them you know what could go wrong so I think what's very important is, is doing a debriefing and things like that um, of, of what could go wrong but otherwise if it's just sort of myself and my colleague and and you know guys in the know then you know you'll you'll do everything as you would as per normal and not really think about what could go wrong and then you sort of handle it um, as it comes you, you have to be very adaptable if that's mm. one thing that I've learned very quickly is you've got to adapt to a multitude of situations and and there's no point in in stressing I mean if you if you stressed about a capture operation there's many things you could stress about if you thought about them but the best way to do it is approach them all the same and you know obviously there's like I said if there's if there's other people involved and things like that like brief look at the situations you you take a look at the whole capture operation in whole and you you look at where the major flaws could be Okay, but the the minor things and where things could go wrong, you know, if an animal wakes up and and stuff like that, um, you know, you sort of got to just handle that as as it comes. So you've got to be very adaptable. So we don't generally, I wouldn't say we generally think um, too often about how much could go wrong Mm. um, because it's, yeah, it's it's a scary thought and you like not to think about it unless it starts happening and then it's a good time to start thinking about it. When, if humans go into surgery, or if I ever do, you know, I want to think that I'm in the most sterile environment as possible. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I'm guessing that you don't get the luxury of that. Unfortunately not. Um, look, it's, it's, in, it's incredible, you know, if, if just, just a few basics, if you just follow the basics that they teach us, you know, at vet school, you know, there's a, there's a lot of basics you can follow that can nullify a lot of the risks and you can be as sterile as possible in, in the field. And there are ways. I mean, there's there's definitely ways. You know, you just got to. There's there's ways of maintaining a surgical field, if you can say that, or a sterile field. Mm. If you're just using the right equipment and you've you've you're the right surgical and aseptic technique, as we call it, aseptic being, you know, just just yeah. You know, so it's difficult to explain the technique per se. I can spend a, a long time here describing the technique, but we call it asepsis as just staying s- as sterile as possible, pretty much. Yeah. So when you, you know, you're washing your hands and when you're gloving up, you, once you're gloved up with your sterile gloves and you glove up in a very specific way, you're not touching anything else anymore that's not sterile. And then you've got assistants that'll hand you sterile instruments, sterile needles and that when they pop the packet open. So then once you were working with whatever the, let's say it's a massive injury, or let's say you've got to do a C-section on a buffalo in the field. Um, you know, you'll, you'll put a drape on, you'll shave the area, you'll scrub it with sterile fluid and, and make sure that you've, you've scrubbed it and disinfected that area as well as you can. And then, you know, you're going to avoid, you're going to try and avoid anything contaminating that area. You know, that's your sterile field. So it's, it's quite incredible how sterile you can stay in the field. Mm. And to that point, wildlife just seems to have this incredible knack and, and resilience. You know, you, you can take a few liberties and you don't do it purposefully you know it's it's not like you you purposefully go in there and you're like it's a wild animal you know it's pretty resilient you you go completely sterile but sometimes things go wrong or there's a couple issues and and you've probably broken your sterile field a little bit or mm. something like that but it's incredible how resilient they are and how well they recover so so a c-section on a buffalo i would have thought from a layman's point of view is that that the time that the, the baby's been you know you've given birth the baby's sort of scrambling to its feet because it needs to be on its feet to run away from predators as soon as possible but it's also got a bond with the mother um now the mum's under anesthetic and there's big stitched up belly what what happens nothing really it's the same as a cow i mean it's like the only difference is that you know a lot of the times you can get away with a c-section in a cow with minimal sedation and, and actually just doing a local block 
um, just using local anesthetic and you numb that area and you can actually carry out a c-section like that you know in the field so it's essentially the same as a as a cow you know once the once the baby's um, out and you've stitched up the animal then you immediately reverse it i mean the 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 drugs that we use in these herbivorous species you can reverse them entirely you know on the spot and that animal will be up in about in 90 seconds so essentially it's the same as if you do it with a cow you know once that baby's out and you reverse that mother they'll nothing to be yeah mm -hmm. okay now earlier you talked about you touched on ethics some people might say that animals are in the wild and you know they get hunted by other predators and whatnot no one's there to save them at that point why should vets come and save an animal in the wild so it's a i mean it's a very tricky one and i and i say you know it's one that's very contentious i mean a lot of people have differing views at, as to when you should actually get involved and interfere because you know a lot of reserves have this view of interfering as little as possible and then others you will have that will actually interfere quite a lot and you know one of the main reasons for interfering are anthropogenic causes so what i mean by that is human caused injuries or issues and that would be something like snaring mm -hmm. something like gunshot wounds where something's been shot and it's injured by a person you know we removed a a inner tire tube from a young elephant that had obviously you know thrown it over its head and it got stuck and so anything that's anthropogenic you get involved in because that's our fault you know and it's our you know it's our what's the word i'm looking for here blanking properly well you've, you've got to make good on the no on the, exactly uh, that's I exactly know, I what you're saying, yeah. looking for. so it's up to us to take care Fix of your it problem when, no, you exactly yeah. you know because yeah. it's it's our it's our issue and you know then when it comes down to things where animals are naturally injured okay injured in fights injured by other predators we we talking particularly on predatory species you know, there's always a lot of infighting between, you know, let's say a wild dog, for example, you know, and it's, it's, they've gone into a tussle with a bunch of hyena. Now, what do you do? Because wild dog are essentially, you know, endangered species. Yeah. And that's where a lot of people, that's where there's a fine line. That's where there's a very fine line. And some people will say, no, you need to get involved because it's a wild dog. And it's the same with rhino, you know, it's exactly the same with rhino. And we've had very differing views on something like that you know for example we've had a, a rhino that was injured in in a big old rhino bull that was injured in a fight with another rhino bull and he was quite grievously wounded and you know at first we weren't entirely sure what the wounds had stemmed from but we were pretty sure that they were natural you know um, and then that's where it becomes very tricky because the purists at heart will say but why are we interfering rhino are it's a rhino you know so that's what everyone it drives a lot of people's decisions they're like it's a rhino we have to interfere and it's a tricky one because it brings up a whole lot of questions you know let's say you interfere now with this rhino bull and you know it's a case in point is one that we did interfere with and i'd asked the question and said you know it is a rhino i understand that but it's a natural injury and the reserve that we dealt with they've got a view of you know minimal interference mm. We decided to treat it and it, it was quite badly injured um, and you know we treated it 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 got up it it wasn't in a good condition and a couple days later in fact the next day you know i was obviously phoning to follow up the whole time and i, I mean when we saw the wounds we said listen this guy's been having a big tussle with a with another bull but he was an old bull a, a mm. big big old white rhino bull so he had been gored a few times big in time, his belly I mean, or? yeah everywhere you know in mm. the under the arms yeah or under the front legs here yeah, you know the the facial area he was he was fairly grievously wounded yeah so you interfere now and you've you've interfered by darting this animal now what happens if he had died under the immobilization because he was in such a terrible state you know mm. now you're dealing with an unnatural situation because now we treated him now and sure we boosted him and we cleaned his wounds out and he'd probably do a little bit better but then a couple of days later they found another rhino bull in the same area also badly injured so they'd got into it you know big time this was the one that had been fighting exactly mm. so then you say okay we've you know it's a territorial fight it's completely natural we understand it's a rhino but now if you interfere you're changing the whole order of things you know it's it's meant to be he's an old rhino bull this is the way of life 
And by, by interfering and treating him, let's say you, you prolong his life, but are you not prolonging his suffering if he carries on tussling now with this bull if he was going to, let's say, and it's, it's going to be a horrible thought, but if he was killed naturally as sometimes happens in these big fights, you know, and now he's feeling a little bit stronger after you've treated him and he's, you know, you've given him some pain medication and he's, you know, he's feeling a little bit better. And off he goes now and they get into a tussle that would have been cut short a while ago. And now they've got another rhino bull that's also fairly badly wounded. So it's such a tricky one because it brings up a multitude of questions. And, we, mm. you know, you could argue it forever and ever because there's, there's so many ways. As, you know, we always see it as you've interfered and that's, it's just that, you know, you've treated wounds. That's all you've done. But it's not. You know, there's always incredible knock-on effects that we never think about. You know, what happens if he had died naturally? You know, he died naturally and there he's died. And so the, a, a hyena clan will come along that, let's say they've been starving or a lion pride that's been struggling to hunt. And they come along and, oh, you know, there's a rhino bull that's died now and they finally found some food. And because of that, they somehow survive. And this is just hypothetically speaking. But now you dart it and the thing dies under the immobilization. You can't leave it out there anymore because those drugs are extremely dangerous to predators. So it's, it's such a toss up and it brings all these questions into play. Like, when do you interfere? When do you do not? You know, and it's. It's a completely personal view and, and everyone's will completely vary. I mean, you know, two people have the same view as to when to interfere and when to not. You'll probably, if there's one case like that, you'll have a hundred different opinions on how you should interfere, if you should interfere and, and all of that. And that's probably one of the trickiest ones is to, is to decide when. And luckily, it's, it's not always ours. You know, we, we can only sort of put our our thoughts forward and say, you know, what we think the prognosis of an animal is and, mm. and if it's worth darting and how, if it will recover. And then we say, okay, look, you know, the, the decision lies, the informed decision will lie with the property and whether or not they want to interfere. Is there not some professional guidelines on this matter? I mean, you know, the only professional guidelines I could say would be the oath we take as veterinarians, you know, when you graduate. And it's the same Hippocratic oath that the, mm. the medical doctors take essentially. So I'd say that's probably the only guideline is that you'd have to be guided by ethics. You know? yep. At the end of the day, it's animal welfare as well. And if it's natural, and now, like I said, you know, we've boosted an animal that would have potentially died naturally. If we've just, prolo have we not prolonged his suffering then if he continues to get into this tussle? So, you know, he's, he's responded well to the treatment, but he's pretty badly wounded mm. you know what have we done by interfering there so and I mean it's it's a very it's a very tricky one to you know it's actually it's a it's a really good example that case but it's also a really bad example in the sense that you know we can't really cover all the bases around it because like I said there's so many questions and so many outcomes around it um, but so ethically you've always got to sit there and look and say it's not just what we're doing immediately what are the ethical considerations and the knock-on effects going down the line by doing what we're doing right now? You know, a lot of the mm. times people will look at things very um, reactively and instantaneously. It's in the moment. And they'll be like, oh, you know, this has happened and oh, you know, we have to treat it. It's a rhino. It's, oh, you know. And then you don't think further. And I think the big thing sometimes is people just need to take a step back. I, try, I mean, it's, it's something, and I'm very new to my career, but it's always something that I try to do in cases like that is step back and just think, by doing this, what are the knock -off? Is there mm. anything else around this whole scenario that we're affecting besides just the individual animal, you know? Especially if we, and I say that because, and like I said, I'm a, I'm a purist at heart, and sometimes I think we're not living in a purist world anymore at all, you know? There's a, I've got to get some realism as well, mm. you know? especially when the big argument comes in like, okay, but you fenced the reserve now. So now would this rhino have moved naturally mm. um, if it was unfenced out of this area and this tussle wouldn't have happened? And you see, so that's what I say. Yeah, for sure. You know, these questions, they just, they, they continue on and on and on. And that's where it becomes incredibly tricky to, to do that sort of thing. Yeah. You, you talked about the wild dog, the rhino examples being endangered. But I guess also, particularly the rhino, I guess, you know, Game reserve owners would have a lot of money invested in those things. They're an attraction for the tourists. Definitely. They've probably spent a lot of money. They've spent a hell of a lot of money protecting the things. Um, yeah. So all of that would come into play too, Definitely. I exactly. would imagine. Exactly. And that's the considerations. But that's where your yeah. ethics come in as well. Because you, you decide now you're prolonging life or doing something based on a human outcome like tourism. Mm. 
you know, because then you're not looking at the animal's welfare anymore. And that's where it becomes very tricky as well, because we've had that, we've had that sort of, you can't, you can't really call it an issue, but it's something that crops up a lot, is, is doing things based on the, the tourism outcomes. Mm. And, and it's, it's outcomes that are not sometimes in the best interest of the animal, per se, Yeah. If, you, if you're thinking of it in that sense. But it's exactly what you're saying. I mean, people, if they've got the big five, you know, and that's their selling point, and it is. The big five is a massive selling point. What do you do if all your rhino are killed? And mm. now you sit with, let's say, you've only got these two bulls are left on your property and they're having a go at each other, you know. You're going to be extremely concerned and worried, and then you have to make a decision based on that. And that's why they'll never, I, I'll stick my neck out on that and say, uh, there'll never be a right way for any of these sort of scenarios. Just because there's, once again, all those variables and considerations and you know the the best way forward is the most ethical and and the one that contributes most to the animal welfare would yeah. be the best way forward but it's it's never going to be the same for two cases mm. and that's why once again the adaptability comes in you know you've just got to be able to adapt to every single situation try and take in as much information as you can and then make a decision that you're comfortable with at the end of the day mm. just that you know and and like i said you know the guys that are making the decisions every single one will have a very different viewpoint yeah and um but which makes for interesting conversation you know? mm. is it the same issue in in larger areas like kruger no i mean they have a very much way more hands-off approach um i say that but um you know i know a couple of rhino that have been put into the bomas and things like that where there's been a couple of you know issues that you're not too sure if they're natural or unnatural um you know so a lot of them, you know, for example, like there was a black rhino recently that I think they, they took into the bomas and that, and it, it, it was just something that was showing up a very interesting um, sort of, a, if I can call it, I can't really call it a disease process, um, but you know, it had an issue going on with one of its legs that a lot of people hadn't seen before. And then sometimes it's, you know, to take it in and, and you just want to check, you know, what's going on here because it wasn't a fractured leg or anything like that. And it, it seemed to be just, it had this massive, you know, like elephant foot. It was a massive swelling in that. Yeah. And they wanted to take samples and things like that. And you want to make sure that, you know, there's nothing disease orientated that's suddenly popping up because you're dealing with black rhino now. You can't have something, especially once again, if it's anthropogenically caused, is it something that's trickling down from something that people have done um, or have introduced? Mm. Um, you know, and when I, when I say things like, as that is an example, you know, with the rhino and that, with the Kruger Park, you have something like canine distemper, which we know has come from the, you know, the local dog populations and has heavily impacted wild dog populations. You know, there's been massive outbreaks. And so that's where, once again, the only interference where people say it's 100% A-OK to interfere where there's no questions asked if, is if it's human caused. Right, OK. And that's the only time. The other ones are the ones that are up for, then it depends on the species, it depends on the scenario, it depends on what it could mean, you know. Public health concerns as well for people, you know. Suddenly you have an, an outbreak of, let's say, anthrax, something like that, you know, in wildlife. And there is, you know, there's, there's a lot more anthrax than people people know of or think about um, and so public health concerns are also a big one which would also sort of drive drive decision making and there's a lot I mean like I said there's a lot that drives the decision making but great the bigger the area the more extensive their system is a place like the Kruger Park the, they probably got sort of like the least the least interference the most mm -hmm. hands-off approach when it comes to sort of interfering oh I mean I say that but I mean yeah it's I'd say, you know, to a point, they also, they also get involved in, on certain situations. And yeah. once again, it's just, you know, whatever they decide and, and their viewpoints will, will drive that. Mm. We talked about snares before, and we've been talking about rhinos. Obviously, there's, you know, a lot of drama in the world in the last 10 years with these, with these poached rhinos, and you talked about dehorning. Mm. Have you ever worked with um, rhinos which have survived a, a poaching incident? I have, but not to the point like some of my colleagues have had to. Like I said, I mean, it's, I'm still very new to my career and I'm pretty sure it will happen. Mm. I mean, we've dealt with a lot of gunshot rhino, but um, luckily I haven't had to deal with any that have had their, their horns hacked off while they were either darted or while they were shot and survived and had their horns hacked off. Um, so it's, it's something I'm very, I count myself lucky. I mean, I know a lot of my colleagues that have had to deal with that. It's not a pleasant experience mm. um, in the least. 
Um, having said that, once again, you know, it's an incredible resilience that these animals have and, and a lot of guys have, have been able to, to turn it around. You know, once it's happened, they've, they've you know, brought these rhinos back, they've managed to, to heal them. Um, so, I mean, in that sense, I'm, I'm very lucky to not have come across that. Yeah. Um, but definitely a lot of gunshots. I've done a lot of post-mortems, um, especially as a student. Um, I used to work with a, a very close friend of mine, Dr. Rowan Leeming, who's down in, in Mfalozi. He's one of the Ezenvelo KZN wildlife vets. And when I was down there, I used to go always down there for my student electives, as we called it. You know, a couple of weeks that you go and spend um, at a, another vet practice. And obviously, I was always going to go and join the wildlife vets. And mm. we did a lot of post-mortems down there, unfortunately. They were exceptionally hard hit in the period that I was down there. Um, and, it, and it takes a toll, um, definitely. You know, it's very challenging um, for the guys down there, the two vets that are down there. Dr. Dave Cooper as well. I mean, he's... The amount of post-mortems and, and horrible things he's had to deal with are, you know, you wouldn't wish that on, on any vet. You mm. know, and it's, I take my hat off to those two guys down there. You know, it's, it's exceptionally hard and very difficult um, to deal with that sort of thing. So I count myself lucky that, you know, the, because we're involved in a private capacity, we're not often called out for the post-mortems and things like that anymore because it's, it's a, if I can call it a governmental issue, so often the... The sand parks guys, if it's within the Kruger Park and that sort of thing, they deal with it. Um, and if it's in a lot of the greater reserves, then many times it's the governmental organizations like, you know, the environmental affairs guys that deal with, with that sort of thing. So we'll only be called out really on a front where, you know, they, they're injured and still alive. Right. I guess it's a crime scene. Completely. I yeah. mean, it's treated, you know, I remember my first ones going in there, I was quite... Um, not not shocked, but um, you know it's exactly that. It's treated completely as a full-on crime scene. You know, taped off. No one's allowed to go in. You know, the police come in first. They take their photographs, all of that, and the the lead investigator will open the crime scene, and he'll say, "Okay, it's you know now the vet can come in and and do the post mortem and carry it out." And um, it's treated. I mean, like yeah, it's, it's treated like a for. I mean, they call it a forensic crime scene. I mean, it's a forensic post mortem essentially. And what would you do? So look, I mean, it it also that. And uh, yeah, I don't know, you know, it, it, it varies completely across the border once again. Um, you know, a lot of guys that are doing a lot of them, um, most often you, you, the main thing is to, to find a bullet. You know, finding a projectile and, and trying to, to sort of establish the cause of death as being that of the projectile. And then, you know, by retrieving that projectile, it goes into the evidence bag and, you know, a lot of guys you know they'll they'll try and link the the projectiles in a certain area to specific guns and and that so if, if ever guys are caught during the prosecution they can try and link the the specific poaching cases to those guys based on the projectiles that were used and the specific patterns that are, are you know embedded on that projectile mm. by the weapon that it was fired from um, so the main focus of the of the forensic post-mortems is to obviously establish cause of death um, but definitely to try and try and retrieve a projectile. So you'll always use a metal detector and, and try and you know retrieve a couple projectiles from from the carcass. Right. Will a metal detector read quite deeply into the? It can. Body it of depends it? on your metal detector. There's yeah. a whole lot of other things that can throw it around. Um, often, you know, animals that lie on one side we call it hypostasis when all the blood starts to pool due to gravity. And there's obviously a high iron content in the blood, and often it can actually run quite a bit of interference um, with a with a metal detector. Yeah. Um, so it's often, it, it depends where it's gone. They, they're very thick skinned, a lot of musculature. So I'd say the fresh carcasses are very challenging to, to actually check. So what you'll often is you'll start cutting. You'll first do like an immediate scan and just see if you pick up anything. And if you don't, then you, you begin to cut, you know, through the layers, you know, you'll take a leg off, you know, and you'll cut the musculature off there and scan every single section, you know, and things like that. Um, and that's sort of how you'll, you'll run. So, you know, everyone has this sort of own systematic approach to it. Okay. Well, let's talk about something a bit more pleasant. Mm. Have you ever experienced gratitude from an animal? Um, which you've saved or helped? Did you ever get a sense that... I wouldn't, to be dead honest with you, I haven't had the, the privilege of having something like mm. that happen yet. Uh, I say that because I, I do believe it has, you know, occurred to many people. And, and I, most of the times when we wake them up, they get up and run away, you know, so there's not much time for gratitude. Mm. <laughs> so, um, it's, a tr it's a tricky one. I wouldn't say, because if I think, yeah, I mean, most of them, you know, it's, it hasn't been 
you know, I see a lot of the ones where people have experienced it is, is not really snarings and things like that. It's often where animals have been trapped, you know, especially elephants. You know, I, I definitely believe out of all of them, you know, if you're going to experience gratitude from an animal, it's most likely going to be an elephant, mm. I'd, I'd, um, especially with what we deal with. You know, they're just incredible animals. And, you know, I've, I've seen many occasions where that sort of happened, where a leopard's... Uh, a leopard, sorry, I, I had leopard as now because I've thought of a specific, like someone else's case. Um, but elephants stuck in the mud, you know, I saw one in Kenya that was stuck recently and, and you know, they, were, they brought water across to it. And I mean, it was an adult elephant stuck in mud like this, you know, in thick, thick mud that it couldn't get out of. And severely dehydrated, very weak, and, and you know, they, they brought water. And the, elephant the other was, elephants from the herd? No, 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 no. The people brought the water. Oh, okay. And, you know, it was sitting there with its trunk into the bucket and it was slurping up the water and, you know, it was ser- sitting there searching for more, searching for more. And if you read that story, I mean, the guys are adamant that, they, you know, there was definitely um, a level of gratitude there once that elephant was pulled out. Mm. So, you know, I haven't had this sort of case in that sense where, where I'd say that I've experienced it, but I have no doubt in my mind that I'm sure somewhere down the line it will, it will happen. And if anything, I'd stick my neck out and say it's probably going to be an elephant. Yeah. Um, if we can jump back to some of those ethical issues that were sort of problematic with when a game reserve owner, you know, they're yes. running a business effectively. Yeah. I would imagine drugs are pretty expensive in, mm. in the veterinary game as they are around the world for, no, for medical issues. Does that become an issue at all in terms of, you know, do they want to... You, you're re- recommending a course of action. Definitely. Do they look at the bill, you know? Yeah. So I must say the the drugs often not so much. Um, they're very understanding of the fact of what you need to knock down an animal. You know, you can't really skimp on that and, and you have to be a... I mean, I don't want to say it because that's going to sound terrible if I say, you know, you have to be a shoddy vet to actually, you know, go and use something that you know is the gold standard in, in an animal like that and then take a risk using a different combination just based on the fact that the, they can't afford it. Mm. Having said that, I, I don't think it's a shoddy vet thing to do sometimes because a lot of guys will make decisions based on that. So at the end of the day, it's almost a calculated risk because they'll say, okay, listen, well, we can't afford this. So you'll say, okay, look, you know, we can use this combination, but it's got its risks. And then you got to, then it's up to you to decide, okay, is it worth, worth taking that risk? Mm. Because if I don't do this, if I do not immobilize this animal, you know, what is the outcome from that? Yep. You know, is it going to die? You know, is there, is there going to be a massive ethical issue? Am I going to sleep at night if I don't immobilize this animal, knowing what could happen because I didn't want to take the risks of using... Uh, you know a different combination mm. and actually that's why you know i'll retract that shoddy vet statement completely because you'll it would be up to you to decide on that um but it luckily the drug side of things not usually where the issue comes in the helicopter is most often the issue okay okay a helicopter is a very expensive machine to run mm-hmm. and so often guys will want you to try and do things from the ground and and obviously it's very risky and, you know if you're working with with um things like elephant and rhino there's obviously the risk that they'll, you know, they'll just bolt off and then, you know, you've got a four or five minutes, you know, with elephants, it's a little bit longer that you're out of control of the situation, you know, and, and that's not even, you know, a lot of the, the commercial guys, because there's, you know, a, a cost, um, a cost issue there, they'll always ask you, can we do it without the helicopter, mm-hmm. you know, and then you've, it's up to you. I mean, you can. You can, but you you definitely tell them, and we always explain to them. We say because the favorite thing of a of a, a game owner to tell you is, no, the animals are incredibly tame. You know, they they tame, but you can do it without a helicopter. They tame. And you get there, and there's one of two things: they tame, but then you dart them, and they're not so tame anymore. Mm. Or that you get there, and these tame animals are like gone in the wind you know and then you sit there and you just drive around the whole day trying to get an animal from the ground when you know that you know from the air it would have been much quicker and these are animals which might be used to game drive viewing yeah and they do they sense that look i mean so it's it's so tricky the it's so varied according to the properties Mm. you know there are definitely there's places you'll go where they they definitely recognize like a different vehicle you you'll always our first thing is to try and use the vehicles that they're used to commercial side of things you always try to use the feeding vehicle it's like one of the best ones to use but what a lot of people don't realize is that certain animals once they show drug effect there's a sort of period of of excitement we call it involuntary excitement because they're not sort of in control of that excitement so 
a tame animal, doesn't matter how tame it is, it can be your pet kudu that you're feeding out of your hand. If you put a dart in it right there while you're feeding it out of your hand, you know, it'll start showing signs and then it'll go through that period of involuntary excitement. And that period can vary. And often, you know, kudu will put their head up, you know, as an example, and they'll just, you know, they'll run. So that tame animal is now a runner. Mm. So we always, if, you know, guys ask us because of the cost of things, can we not use the helicopter? We always say, okay, but listen, you know, because it's, it's at the end of the day, if the animal dies, it's on us because we can't find it, you yep. know, or when we find it, it's gone down in an absolutely horrific position, which you could have stopped if you were in a helicopter and you could have just quickly landed or you could have controlled its movements or now it's gone down in a dam and it's drowned or, yeah. you know, there's a whole lot of things that can happen. And then it'll always come back on the vet. Whereas you say, like, you know, I explained the risks to you guys, you know, and, and so it's always actually a certain amount of risk you take on yourself as well. But it's once again, it's always calculated and you always got to say, look, you know, we can do it, but you guys have to understand that this could go very wrong. Okay. So, yeah. and that's the main thing, as long as the client or the farm owner or the wardens or whoever it may be, understand the risks involved by doing it a certain way. Yep. You know, I think clarity is the most important thing. You know, all parties need to understand what's going on. And a lot of times I think that's, if there's a communication breakdown, that's where it can fall apart. So I think if you're going to do something like that, like we say ethically, again, it's just be as clear as possible as to what the potential outcomes could be and then, you know, mm. make the decision. It sounds like helicopters can be of great assistance to yeah. your role. What, what else is on the fringe, the near future? What's happening technologically, which is assisting you to do your job, whether it's man management or emergencies? Um, look, I mean, it's... I think it, there's a lot of talk and I mean, I haven't really come across anything yet, but when there's talk like that is, you know, you always wonder what's coming and I think drones are going to start playing a bit of a bigger part. You know, it'll be interesting to see if the technology that's involved in drones being able to follow a specific person, for example, um, in a group of people where it you be cycling, running or, or skiing or whatever, it somehow has this, you know, algorithm in its programming that it can follow a specific person. You know, I mean, if you could if you could adapt that to and whether or not it works already now, you know, we've been wanting to try it for a while, but to go and spend that money on a drone just to see if it works, you know, is not like the the best way to approach your boss and say, let's get a drone. It might work. You know, mm. it's a lot of money to spend because there's a lot of things then you could do them from the ground because you could have this drone follow them because it's it's very challenging to look at that screen and follow follow an animal is, is challenging. You know, we've tried it with wild dogs especially once you've triangulated their position with the telemetry and you try and send the drone in to find them and it's incredibly challenging on that screen to to follow a wild dog you know and our plan was because we knew they were a skittish pack if we mm. got a dart in the plan was okay we're going to follow it with a drone and very quickly realized that's going to be incredibly challenging you know so yeah i'd say you know drones might play a bigger part i don't know where i don't know how people speak about drone darting and all of that and you know who's to say it can't happen you know um, maybe somewhere down the line uh, mm. that could that could essentially happen you know I know a couple of people using sort of thermal imaging cameras um, during nighttime predator call-ups and stuff like that but it's a lot of equipment that at this time is very expensive you know you there's very few people that are using it yeah um, so it's still a lot of the old school methods are still being used now yep. you know I mean maybe dart gun technology might change to make them i don't know more accurate or you know with built-in no nah, but you know i actually don't even know that could we it's still such a old tried and tested method most mm. of what we do that you know at the moment the only thing that's been applied a little bit that we've sort of come across i'd say is is drones yeah what about the medical side i, I met someone recently and they had they were performing some hysterectomies on lion messes. No, so yeah, I mean that sort of side of things definitely. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot happening. There's a big focus on, on especially the anesthesia side of things, the immobilization. The drugs are constantly evolving. You know, finding safer combinations, safer ways to knock them down, finding the, trying to trend towards the ideal drug. Whether or not we'll ever reach an ideal drug somewhere down the line. Um, remains to be seen but in sort of the anesthesia immobilization side there's a lot and then also definitely a lot being tried in surgical techniques and things like that I mean constantly you know wildlife is still a very very new industry um, and a new sort of um, profession if you can say that so there's a big focus sometimes now on some of the stuff that guys are doing you know fracture treatments and um, you know there's there's a lot of 
It's, a lot of it sort of starts in zoos because that's a controlled environment. So mm -hmm. a lot of things will be tried in zoos first and then they'll be extrapolated and tried out in the field if they're finding some success there. Um, so definitely, I mean, guys did a, what was it? It was sort of a, a, a castration in, in elephants, like a laparoscopic, you know, they castrated, vasectomized, a, you know, an adult elephant bull. You know, yep. they had it in straps and they had him held up and, and you know, they did it sort of with the laparoscopic with the, the little cameras and everything, you know. So that sort of thing, you know, those sort of things they are trying. There's a lot of, I don't want to call it experimentation, I want to say research. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of research happening in, in all fields, in the surgical, the medical. Unfortunately, I say unfortunately, but there's a lot of guys that are more, it's sort of quite a specialized um, industry in that sense. If you, if a lot of the equine specialist vets and the, the guys in terms of surgical specialization, they would be the guys that would try these things. Yeah. You know, um, on our side, a lot of the times it's, you know, we'll call someone like that um, because it's not something we come across a lot and we're not specialized in surgery. So to, mm. to go out and try something, you'd be remiss to do so. So we'll be more involved in looking at the immobilization side of things. And that's where a lot of, a lot of the research that we're interested in is, um, when I say we, I mean sort of where myself and my colleague are working for and for who we're working for. Whereas a lot of guys will be more focused on the surgery side of things. And there's a big interest in the medical side of things as well, you know, with, with a lot of issues that are coming up. You know, the more we look at wildlife, the more we realize how little we know. Mm. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a cliched saying when we talk about anything environmental, we know so little about the natural world as, as uh, you know, Attenborough would probably say and would be correct. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that we still need to find out. And, I mean, it's, it's come so far. I mean, I can't even explain to you if I, if I read some of the, the, the books and what the drugs they used to use, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you know, I mean, it's unbelievable. You think they're like, how did you do that? You know, there's, I mean, there's videos of guys catching giraffe where they drove next to them in an old clapped up Chevy with guys on the back that used to throw a lasso over the giraffe and then they'd like pull it, you know, next to the, the vehicle and you know that's giraffe capture then they'd lead it awake into a crate and mortalities used to be you know close on 100 percent because the animals stressed themselves to death you mm. know and you look at the like, operation noah's ark in lake kariba when the when they broke that dam and they and they flooded that area and it became you know kariba and they took six thousand animals you know off those little islands and they were catching black rhino i mean the video footage the black and white video footage of that is just you know spectacular I mean, someone told me the other day, and I found it so interesting. They found a little, oh, I'd be lying to you if I could remember where or who, but it was a little manuscript of guys that were catching elephant, oh, over a hundred years ago. Like, you know, I can't even For remember. circuses or something. To right? take across, like on the ships to, you know. Zoos. And exactly. Yeah. And they, the, on it, it wrote. So, I mean, obviously, and, you know, speaking back in those days, they used to write as natives, as the, as the local African population, mm. you know. And they'd say, we caught an elephant today. Only 25 natives died today. It was a good day. And then they explain how they captured them. And they used to chase them with ropes and rope them until they pulled them down. And you're like, you know, that's, so that's how far we've come, you know. Wow. And it's, mm. it's, it's quite phenomenal to read something like that. And even going just as young as 20, 30 years ago, this, it's incredible how far, and, and you know, the, the drugs have made the big difference. I mean, the yeah. drugs have come such a long way to, to making it incredibly safe, you know, um, to a point. Mm. Yeah, well, I suppose you, you do the best with which you have at the time. No, definitely, no, exactly, and that's that so much respect for those guys yeah. because they were the, you know, at the forefront of it. You know, yeah. I can't imagine catching black rhino the way that some of the guys were doing, you know, such a cantankerous species. And, you know, you can imagine how many people were injured and hurt. And, but I mean, that was, you know, what else do you do? You know, they were trying, mm. they were trying to find a way, you know, and that's yeah. led to what we have today, you know. Yes, of course. Is, and, and the whole drug incredible. industry too, I would no, imagine. exactly, exactly. Okay, you mentioned Richard Attenborough before. I'm going to test your knowledge on, <laughs> on animals and in fact you could tell me anything because I, I don't have the answers but what I'd like to do is just throw a few animal names African animal names out to you and if you're able to you don't have to use Richard Attenborough's accent but if you no, can um, if you can tell us something interesting about that animal whether it's a, a fact or an anecdote okay. that you might have and um, and you know you get extra points for entertainment <laughs> okay so the first one's a leopard okay 
Um, well, it's a good choice. It's actually my favorite animal. So um, they're sort of, I won't say my party trick, because I mean, mm. a lot of people know it locally, but we have quite a big student contingency that comes from overseas that we do training with. And we've been lucky to do a lot of leopard immobilizations this year and, and quite an interesting one and something that a lot of people don't know is that leopard urine actually smells like buttered popcorn. So no. it doesn't smell like cat pee, which we all know smells absolutely shocking. So yep. one of my favorite things to do is to, to obtain some leopard urine and then convince the, it's, an, it's always a massive challenge as well to try and convince people like you walk around with this little vial of leopard urine, you know, leopard pee and you say, no, listen, smell this. No, really smell this. Like you won't believe what it smells like, you know? And yeah, it's, I mean, it's hell of interesting and everyone's always shocked by that. And it's one of those, like if you smell it once, if you're ever walking around in the bush or you're driving around and a, and a leopard's cruise there and mark the territory, it's uncanny. You'll be driving around, you know, and then you'll be like, oh, you know, what's that? A leopard's been here, definitely. Like, really? Did you smell that, you know? It's incredibly pungent in that sense, like, but it smells, and I know I'm going to sound like a bloody cuckoo if I say, you know, it smells amazing. Mm. But um, yeah, leopard urine smells like buttered popcorn. There you go. There might be a yeah. ma market for that in some sort of... Yeah, no, exactly. Cologne. Exactly. Well, I mean... I don't know if you've heard about the, and this is probably some free advertising, but of the <laughs> Calvin Klein obsession, the eau de toilette, how yeah, I'm, cats I'm go crazy for that. The cats? Yeah. The, oh, seriously? The, I promise you, they used it a lot and <laughs> they discovered it in zoos. Yeah. There was actually, a, there was a published paper. I want to I say it was published. I think it was published or it was a case report, but they were looking at things for environmental stimulation for animals in the zoos. Yeah. I think they did it on cheetah first and they started to use cologne so it's just you know they'd spray it once they were in their night rooms you know they'd go and spray it on some rocks so that the next day when they came out they'd walk around and they'd sniff the area and it would just you know just stimulate them yeah and they started to notice that the different ones that they used seemed to have like it held their interest for different time periods and by spraying a few they decided to run like a little mini study and they saw that calvin klein obsession where and i, I mean don't quote me on the figures because i'd i'd, I'd be talking absolute rubbish but most of them were sort of in like the low 10 to 15 seconds kept them interested and then the Calvin Klein obsession had them interested for like two minutes. So guys started to use it in cage traps. I mean, you know, if you're trying to trap a leopard and you, you're trying to catch it, then you spray that in the trap. If you, a lot of guys started to use it in India where they were trying to get um, camera trap, you know, using camera traps to, for population sensors. Mm. They started to spray it a little bit because they weren't getting nice ID photos because the animals were just cruising past really quickly sure. and they weren't getting great shots. So they started to spray it in a certain area so that the animal would actually stop and then they, you know, they got fantastic results. So, yeah. Does, has it been sort of analyzed pheromonically, if that's such a word? I think, to, I think that, I want to say thing, that they or? did. I remember trying to read up on it, but it definitely some, you know, obviously a, a chemical compound that's mm. very similar to some sort of pheromone that interests these cats. You know, there must be some sort of, you know, chemical compound there. And it's, it's incredibly, it's crazy. I mean, we, it's very, very interesting. We actually started using it. We've got like a predator holding facility when we're disease testing um, predators before they're being relocated to another reserve. And we use it as environmental stimulation. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Uh, a mamba. Black mamba. So, a black mamba. Or a snake. So, yeah. So, snakes in general. Um, I mean, from a veterinary point of view, and it's, it's something that I've... I mean, obviously, reptiles and exotics are quite a specific um, point of interest. And, you know, it's just sort of a specialized side of things. But one interesting sort of from a veterinary aspect, I guess, and I don't know if anyone or everyone else will find it interesting, but I found it very interesting, is that if you inject, because you can immobilize, you can immobilize snakes, reptiles, you know, we can immobilize everything essentially. And if you want to immobilize them with an injectable, as, let's pretend as if you were darting an animal, if you wanted to inject some drugs into a snake to immobilize it so you could work on it, like we were doing a mumba that had a, a prolapse of the cloaca, so just that, you know, sort of there. I don't butt know. Hole. Their butt hole. <laughs> what is it called? Cloaca. 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 Yeah. So I hope I never have. No, exactly. That. So to put yeah. it back, you know, we had this mumbo that um, obviously the guy was busy holding, but we said, you know, we can immobilize it. But if you inject a snake, so when we speak about caudal and cranial, we mean the back end and the front end. Let's yep. say front half, back half. Mm -hmm. If you inject a snake in the back half, they've got a special sort of we call it a renal portal system and we're just not even getting into the science of it sort of the the system of circulation blood circulation there 
if you inject a drug into the into the back section they they say now the research has shown that you know you're not going to get effect because it goes straight to the kidneys and it can be excreted so you have to inject them in the front half mm. otherwise you're not going to come right and that's why a lot of people have struggled before like you know they'll inject a snake and that dose would have worked on the python they did three months ago and then a snake comes in and they inject it but they inject it in sort of towards that back end they won't they won't sleep <laughs> yeah there you go giraffe so giraffe yeah giraffe's an interesting one i mean there's a lot of their anatomy that's quite interesting and i mean i won't delve too much into it but um so i mean they the out of all the terrestrial mammals they've got the thickest skin so oh. even more so than rhino and elephant yeah. um so you know we'll use very very long darts for them um they've actually got valves in their their veins um so that you know when they and in their sort of circulatory system they've got valves so when they're drinking for example not all the blood will suddenly rush to their head and mm. with a massive increase in blood pressure um which is quite an interesting adaption obviously for them yeah um and then in terms of you know in general giraffe capture is probably my favorite capture and it's it's going to sound brutal but it's it's actually the absolute best and most ethical way to capture giraffe and they once you actually have to trip them so it's organized chaos giraffe capture so they are they darted from the air mm -hmm. and you have a tripping team on the ground who sits in the back of hopefully a land cruiser with a massive bull bar because you oftentimes end up just crashing through the bush and what happens is they go into sort of this drug phase and they're very sensitive to the drugs um so you actually overdose them and someone only discovered this you know a couple years ago and realized you know if you overdose them it's the best way to capture them because you can get them down very quickly but what you need to do is once they start showing the drug effects they sort of they put their head up and they're just running you know you have to pull them down as soon as possible um, because that's you know the drug effects can actually end up killing them they're very very sensitive to the drugs um, so you will race ahead the helicopter will tell you where the giraffe is and you'll race with your land cruiser and your capture team on the back is usually about eight guys with a whole lot of ropes and they will you will try and get ahead of the giraffe and then these guys will jump off the back of the vehicle and you run in front of the giraffe and you try and break it you get a rope across its chest and then you just hang on for dear life and then the other guys come and once you've slowed it down like you, something out of a cowboy it's movie. crazy then you run and you wrap <laughs> around the the giraffe's legs and you pull him down really? and then you you just hold once you've got control over the neck and head area they can't stand up because what essentially happens from then is you blindfold them and you put ear plugs in just to decrease the stimulation and you actually give them a complete reversal essentially of the drugs um, and they essentially awake there's a, a mild sort of sedative effect from the drug but luckily giraffe are sort of very very docile in nature um, and that's like giraffe capture and then you let them up and you lead them in with a halter and a lead rope like you would a horse into a trailer and off you drive. I, um, I had the good fortune to join a giraffe capture, the latter stages of it, yeah. once it was coming out of its drug phase and they used two ropes to, in a V way so as, as they let it, it would feel the rope and yeah. move away from it. Went in there and I was, I was tasked with jumping up on top of the trailer and being on one of the sides and holding the, the harness and apart from the sheer size of the thing I mean I was up on the highest point of the trailer tiptoeing and the thing was still miles taller yeah, than that's me unreal. but what struck me was the smell of the thing mm. it, it wasn't a pleasant smell no is that what can you describe I'm not too something? sure look I mean all the animals sort of have their own smell it's amazing mm. some are pleasant some are not I mean I don't know if you've ever been close to uh, some of the predators they really don't smell great no um, wild dogs and hyena are quite smelly fellas um, but yeah, everyone has their own smell and it's funny because you'll find like you didn't enjoy that smell and mm. you'll find some people will absolutely love it. Really? Yeah, absolutely. There's guys that love the smell of a wild dog and there's guys <laughs> that are like, are you absolutely crazy? <laughs> so no, it's, it's, they, they all, all the animals sort of have their distinct smell mm. and, a, and a lot of them, like a lot of with your antelope species and that, you know, they've, a lot of them have got sort of um, uh, glands where they'll, you know, that's where they'll sort of secrete, um, you know, sort of fluids containing pheromones in and that's oftentimes what, what will give them a specific smell you know water buck for example you know they've sort of you know to dumb it down they've got like a waterproof a water layered fluid in their in their sweat glands they've got modified like sweat glands you know and that's what that pungent you get a pungent smell with water buck and that's why they often say predators won't often eat water buck 
because it's a, not a great taste from, mm. from that. Um, so they all, they all have their own weird and wonderful smells. There you go. One more animal to wrap it up, uh, kudu. So, kudu, in, so instead of speaking about the kudu, I'll speak about the spiral horned antelope in general, just mm. from once again from an absolute veterinary perspective. Um, they, so we, they're the tragolophian species, okay? So, so oh, sorry, genus is tragolophus, okay? And those are all your spiral horned antelope. And they're quite interesting in the fact that once you dart them, once they get into this sort of, um, we call it the induction phase, they sort of start to high step like a, like a dressage horse. And once they start showing those signs, you can actually call them in. You can whistle or you can wave or you can wave, a, often we'll take a blindfold and you just wave it around and let's say that Nyal has run into some thick bush. Mm. Clap your hands, wave and they'll come trotting right up to you. And then you just grab them by the horns, you turn them around a little bit and they'll go down. Have you any idea what's going through the head when Nothing. They're mm. definitely tripping out on the drugs a little bit, <laughs> for lack of a better, like scientific description. It's you know, it's just a it's just a drug effect, mm. and you're getting them in a phase where they're still very responsive to stimulation, and they'll run towards you know sound and and you know sight and and movement, you know, and it's it's just absolutely a drug effect, just to to explain it very basically. And, and I mean, bushbuck, nyala, kudu, eland. I mean, they'll they'll all. If you do that, they'll come in. And we do it all the time with Nyala. And it's amazing doing it with people that haven't seen it for the first time because you look like a massive, you know, mm. massive hero. Check yeah, this exactly. guy. He's a, a guru. He's but... like an animal whisperer of <laughs> yeah. sorts. You know, what's he doing here? For sure. Joel, thank you so much for joining me today on no Tales worries. Less Told. It's been very informative and yeah. entertaining. Um, and I wish you all the best for the future. No, thank you very much, Richard. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. So